Why did England not revolt? Why did she not have a mass revolution akin to that of the French? Moreover, did her industrial masses ever solidifying into a cohesive class, the working class, not seem ripe for one? Right at the beginning of that Victorian age. Let us use heifer as our spine and try to flesh out why a general convulsion never materialized. She was probably closest in the 1840s, the angry 40s as they're called. And we consider this um, a sort of moment at the brink to dissect. Let's recall how Heffer has already introduced Thomas Arnold, who cultivated moral leaders from his position as schoolmaster rugby, 1828 to 1841. One of the perceived roles uh, in the eyes of Dr. Arnold was to be a leadership class, more agile, more dutiful, more purposeful than stagnant aristocracy. Uh, such a class would be a preventative measure against insurrection and disorder. He would seen that as one of his tenets. He did not want the affluence of the few to be destroyed by the revolution of the masses, as he, in his own words. Such um, revolution would not be able to re-establish any influence at all. And of course the masses were multiplying, weren't they? 8.3 million in 1801 to 12.99 in 1831, and then up again to 15.1 in 1841. The workhouses were established under the 1834 Poor Law, and why by the 1840s uh, being proved inadequate. Not only for the poor, but also for the educated classes who were appalled by it. But if we look at the National Archives and their teachings on this, they tend to present the poor laws as just from that perspective, the perspective of weren't they appalling, and look at those who suffered through it. Now that's one way to look at it, but another is, how did those in the decision-making position manage to mediate those conditions so that it didn't turn into a mass revolt. The workhouses were a topic of debate amongst the intellectual class as well as the statesmen uh, of parliament. And who was a greater intellectual of the 1840s than one Thomas Carlyle? Of course, he was not a fan of the poor laws. And neither was Dickens, who used it to inspire his writings of Oliver Twist in 1837, uh, seen by many as anti-poor law propaganda. Similar to Gaskell's Mary Barton for how this intellectual class and this literary class were reacting to the law. Carlyle in particular quoted that the people are sick of the misgovernment and the blackguards among them shoot at the poor queen. All men are becoming alarmed at the state of the country, as I think they well may. So he thought there was a misdirection of grievance there, which he noted amongst the lower classes. And there were riots uh, in Manchester whipped up by the Anti-Corn Law League. There were links between this league and then the Chartists in turn. So we can see from poor law agitation to Anti-Corn Law League to Chartists, there was the possible creation of something akin to the advocacy class that we saw in the French Revolution. There were links, um, Richard Cobden, who led the league, and to even people who may have had influence on Parliament. And Cobden used a moral case as well as an economic case against the Corn Laws, which spilt over from the Poor Law debate. The Corn Laws were a prize protection for landed aristocracy that had been in place in some form since 1815, but it was in 1839 that their repeal became a full-blown issue. The Chartists themselves then had a political charter with six points on it that needed remediation. 1. Vote for all men over 21. 2. The establishment of a secret ballot. 3. No property qualification to become an MP. 4. Payment for MPs. 5. Electoral districts of equal size, so the end of a sort of gerrymandering and rotten boroughs. 6. Annual elections for Parliament. The establishment of such a particular charter actually can be seen as one of the reasons why there was no mass revolt. Carlyle equates the revolt in France, that of moments of Bastille or the August insurrection or the March of the Women. There is a, you need a, a hunger amongst the poor and also an insertion of chaos, which by having a particular charter with a distinct set of points 
tends to focus your reform rather than establishing the chaos of mass revolt. So that can be seen as one of the reasons. The fact that the Chartist movement seemed to have particular aims working within the system. The Liberals, were le- uh, led by Lord John Russell, actually joined in the demand for the repeal of the Corn Laws, which can also help the situation because one of the parties, the internal party, the Whigs, uh, the last of the Whigs, just before they became re-established as the Liberal Party, were in favour of the repeal and were inheritors of that sort of uh, Charles James Fox Whiggish sense of the world. In 1841, Robert Peel became Prime Minister, and by 1843, William Gladstone, as President of the Board of Trade, was calling them uh, a temporary measure. The Poor Law, in the meantime, was seen by the Home Secretary Sir James Graham, second baronet, uh, to make no distinction between the deserving and the undeserving poor, a vital Victorian distinction, which again helped suppress any idea of revolt because once you've categorized the this emerging class the working class into deserving and undeserving you sort of bifurcated the class and weakened it and by making that distinction you, you you're no longer doing our block versus your block graham had joined the government in 1835 and would have been no stranger to the uh, Prime Minister Lord, ex Prime Minister Lord Liverpool's social conservatism, which had reigned in the 1820s. By 1842, Peel and Graham, though, had agreed that it was not a matter of whether the working class would act, but when. This is also another reason why we can see where the revolt did not happen, because people like Graham and Peel were working within the cabinet and were already dealing with the issue that, the, that there would be some sort of um, inflagration. Whereas the stale aristocracy of the 1780s were, had no such idea in France. So we have this idea of Burkean conservatism. You know, assume the change is when rather than whether, and you direct the energy of the change. Uh, that is another factor as to why they were able to abate it. Whether you agree with Peel's motives or not, it is a serves as a function as a, of a sort of release valve. Peel himself... Also worthy to note was not aristocratic. It's also probably helped him to suppress a wider revolt because he was, though leader of the Tory party, not of the class that were seen to enact the Corn Laws for their own self-service. His convergence with Graham was then seen as between classes. And Dr. Thomas Arnold was not impressed, though, um, by the stubbornness of backbench Tories to reform, even an Arnold, who would later be mocked by Lytton Strachey and the left, the ascendant left throughout the 20th century. Even he was realised the need for reform in the industrial landscape. And in 1836, he wrote that vulgar minds, talking of the Tory backbenchers, can never understand the duty of reform till it is impressed on them by argumentum ad ventrum. So around this issue of reform, a political party, the Tories were already being harangued by a diverse range of educated classes, Think Arnold, think Carlyle, of course think John Stuart Mill, who we haven't even mentioned. Also in 1836 uh, was the same year that Thomas Carlyle released his French Revolution, so the minds would have been drawn to this enormous book, which captivated its audience. It was a sort of right-wing critique to a stagnant aristocracy. And that can also be seen, so the reaction can also be seen as Carlylean as well as Burkean, as the reasons why the, the revolts never occurred in England the same way they had in France. Carlyle saw Chartism, though, as a force, uh, the result of abandonment by the responsibilities of the moneyed classes. Mammonism, as he called it, was taking sway over the old feudal tides. This is the consequence of his romantic belief in feudalism, and his book, Chartism, was published in 1839 to address uh, his thoughts on the matter. And it was published by uh, Mill's Westminster Review, after the Quarterly Review, one of the more usual outlets for him, had refused to publish it. So John Stuart Mill served as an outlet for him. Their friendship still fairly intact at this stage. Its first chapter was called The Condition of England Question, and there would be a phrase that would reverberate and resonate for decades. Carlyle quotes in it, is quoted in it saying, 
A feeling very generally exists that the condition and disposition of the working classes is a rather ominous matter at present. He felt a reformed parliament would not grasp with the difficulty of it. So here he sort of differs to Thomas Arnold. Reform alone, or this belief in reform, would not be enough. It would also be obsessed with the low politics. Think of point five that the Chartists had. Or point four, rather, payment for MPs. So mammonism to infect MPs, this would have been the Carlylean take. No property qualification to become an MP. So no stay in the land beyond your own career gain. Whether or not you believe that the Chartist points were appropriate considering the situation at the time, it's also worthy to note that the flaws pointed out by Carlyle that can be seen in these Chartist positions have had long-term ill effects on government. Instead, what did Carlyle advocate for? Well, a strong leader using coercive force, perhaps inspired by his hero, Cromwell. He was even more savage than Arnold. The new poor law, he said, is an announcement sufficiently distinct that whosoever will not work ought not to live. The working classes cannot any longer go on without government without being actually guided and governed. So government, uh, for Carlyle, would not be a passive affair. It needed to be stringently governed, but in the right direction. With the supreme triumph of cash, he, co- he said, a changed time has entered. There must be a changed aristocracy to enter with it. So for him, the land classes were too busy preserving their game. And this is what the Corn Law was seen as. Rather than to accept the new position and to reposition yourself appropriately. In short, we must have more wisdom to govern us. We must be governed by the wisest. We must have an aristocracy of talent. You can almost read that as a view towards technocracy in Carlisle. But as long as it was a technocracy that had conviction. Carlyle's remedy that the state should expand its fighting service, which would restore order, and that other services internally, which would actually work as a restorer of order. So you could put the state to work as long as it instilled order and discipline into the people to stop this wax and wane and this slow descent into depravity. He wanted a working aristocracy of mill owners, manufacturers, to get involved. Carl's remedy was that the state would venerate such people. Men, these men, these new men, the talented aristocracy, must strike into a new path, he said. Must understand that money alone is not representative either of man's success in the world or of man's duties to man, and reform their own selves from top to bottom if they wished England reformed. So actually, in a weird way, the fantasy medievalism, I think Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe and so on, uh, which had been in the milieu of the time, what what the left is called self-indulgent nostalgia was actually advancing critiques against the system of the 1840s far better than any cohesive mass revolt of our class against yours was actually doing. Another character worthy to note when you think of career, the ascent of the careerist in politics, but also the ascent of the, the practicality perhaps a man who realised that the, a new mode of, of a politician was needed, is Benjamin Disraeli. Also like Peel, not from the aristocracy, but adopted their views initially, um, as expressed in his writings. By the time he published Sybil in 1845, it was breaking away from his Young England movement, which was sort of people who wanted the absolute monarchist's position. And Heffer claims uh, this was for reasons of expediency. Young England was sort of, as well as just absolute monarchism, it wanted noblesse oblige, it wanted uh, more stringent feudalistic tides, and a strong established church, which you can sort of see elements of Thomas Arnold's insertion of the Christian morality in there. Uh, This movement, though, of course, was dying away with the anti-corn law repeal, and Disraeli becomes a key actor in making the switch. But it's interesting to note that in his younger years, he was head of this organization in university, and there was still this idea that nobility could rise from the condition of England uh, that was not degenerate, that could deal with the question, as Carlyle phrased it. And Disraeli, more than anyone else in this book, this Simon Heffer book on high minds, seems to have his finger on the pulse of power as an abstract thing that you could 
hold on to. Another character, rather than the wily Disraeli, who could help stem the flow of a mass revolution from above, is a man who genuinely was from the aristocracy and did throughout his life strive to personify that noblesse oblige, and that is one uh, Lord Ashley. Anthony Ashley Cooper, 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, to give him his full title. His example of stopping the March Revolution from a sense of noblesse oblige, as we had said, he was heir to the Earldom of Shaftesbury at the time and was a Tory MP. His idea was, we are taking these Gospels to these far-flung colonies, we are trying to instill a sense of morality to the natives, but we need to do the same to our own British working class. We need to take the Gospels, take our learnings, and head into the British slum, not just the far-flung colony with it. Ashley, like Peel and Gladstone, had graduated from Christ Church, Oxford, with a first. Yet he was, as well as an intelligent man, an intellectual man, he was a man who, unlike them, opposed the 1832 Reform Bill and the secret ballot, as stated in the Chartist Objection. Yet he would also drive legislation to protect mentally ill, to protect working poor. Ashley wrote in the Quarterly Review for his own concern around child chimney sweeps and pointed to Prussia banning children uh, under 16 working for more than 10 hours a day. Would England follow? And eventually, yes, he helped sculpt the 1833 Factories Act. He did have a different view of where the world was in 1840 than Peel or even a Graham. And it's interesting to see that it, that avenue still existed as a means to, to deal with the revolution. 1844, Graham and Ashley clashed over a proposed cut in hours to the working poor. Graham sought to protect the industrialist. Uh, he said that the side of the Corn Laws, he, he would cite the Corn Laws as a weapon to use against Ashley to say that he was for the preservation of the Corn Laws, which even by now Gladstone was admitting were temporary. And Ashley stated that he could not have cared less about the Corn Laws. For him, it was mainly about the poor laws and the working poor. But because he was from the aristocratic background, his, his position of his class with the Corn Laws could be used against him. So it's interesting. Where did the working class point their anger? This is another reason why they couldn't have a mass revolution. There was no one obvious thing to point your distress at because you have Graham defending the poor laws, but being against the Corn Laws or ready for their repeal, and then a vice versa situation for Shaftesbury. He also clashed with John Bright, the liberal reformer, the incarnation of the middle, the rising middle. Bright saw the limitation of working hours as a limitation on the earning power of the operatives. Bright held the liberal view, state has no right to disrupt the bargain struck between master and man, which obviously jars with Shaftesbury, and of course jars with Carlyle, as we stated earlier. Though Carlyle wanted an aristocracy of talent, which included industrialists, he wanted the industrialist to take up the mantle of the class he had inherited and be more than a mammon worshipper. He stood with Shaftesbury, did Carlyle, against this laissez-faire. Uh, and when he read the report by Edwin Chadwick, who was the secretary of the Poor Law Commission, he was appalled by the state of him short span of life and the sanitary conditions led Carlyle to say it is one of the most hideous facts I ever fall on the history of mammon worship and laissez-faire what about that undeserving deserving distinction we had earlier that Graham had uh, cited London poor did still manage uh, during these years to spend three million pound annually on gin so there was merit in Graham's argument Shaftesbury uh, calculated that £1.8 million pound was needed uh, to be poured into education at the public expense and outlined figures from Manchester and Birmingham that showed a correlation between illiteracy at a young age and then the crime and establishments of brothels and beer houses and so on. So he was fed with a moral purpose that we saw Carlyle have earlier, did his calculations and was willing to put his sense of noblesse oblige into a parliamentary scale. To tie it back to Dr. Thomas Arnold, he was, quote, utterly disgraced by the character of a Christian country to allow this to occur. His campaign against the poor laws did get muddled into the aristocratic stance of the corn laws, though, as the 1840s wore on, where, with loyalty to class and his own sense of noblesse oblige, he likely defended. 
It was used as a rod to attack him by those who had benefited from the widening of the franchise in 1832, which of course Shaftesbury had opposed. So really we can see the 1840s having dealt with the Corn Laws before the Poor Laws, leaving out the part of Shaftesbury to establish a sort of new noblesse oblige on the parliamentary scale. His position on the Poor Law, though, helped to diffuse a revolution where those who simply campaigned on a Corn Law as a fair basis, basis may have turned a blind eye. And he did so ultimately outside Parliament with the help of setting up the Anglican National Society and it began to fund to set up schools and manufactories and mining districts out of his own coffers. Ashley's vision, working outside Parliament while the Corn Laws got repealed within it, was the ultimate uh, dual action which averted revolution. We must entertain higher thoughts from them for and for England, said Ashley, when speaking of the poor. We must raise them to a level on which they may run the course that is set before them as citizens of the British Empire, heirs of a glorious immortality.